Hi everybody, I'm Rick Beato. Today's Everything Music is called How the Pros Use Compression. It's how they use it on individual instruments and on the mix bus. It's coming up next. Okay, so what is compression? A compressor in music is something that makes music or instruments sound louder without increasing its amplitude. Amplitude is volume. Makes things sound louder without increasing its volume. It's also used to turn down the loudest part of a sound to make it sound more even or consistent. So if I have a bass player and he's playing where some notes are really loud and some notes are really soft, I'm gonna compress the bass so that it's more even and it sits in the mix a lot better. Because if I don't compress it, it's gonna sound like it's coming in and out. And one of the things about your low end in your mix is that you don't want the low end to be dropping in and out. Ratio. Ratios and threshold of the compressor determine when the compressor actually kicks in and is working. Once it passes a certain threshold, the compressor kicks in and starts to reduce the sound or the amplitude. Two to one compression ratio is usually where you begin engaging compression. One to one is no compression at all, as you see here. Straight line, that's just the sound directly through. Two to one is the lowest ratio, four to one, six to one, 10 to one, and 20 to one. Over 20 to one is basically limiting. Here's your compression curves. One to one, boom, that means it's not even on. Two to one, you're just reducing the dynamics a slight bit. Four to one, you're reducing a little more. And 20 to one, and this is infinite to one, you're limiting. 20 to one is pretty much gonna sound like limiting anyways. Limiting is where the sound goes up, hits a brick wall, and doesn't go any louder. It flat tops the sound or flat tops the wave. If you look at a sound that's been highly compressed in tracking, it literally is flat topped, meaning the waveforms have a top on them, like a little plateau and straight over. That's one of the reasons why you don't typically compress distorted electric guitars or synths that have square waves. Any type of uh, Moog synthesizer sounds, things like that, or buzzy sounding pads, you don't have to compress those sounds because they're already compressed because they're basically square wave sounds. And a square wave goes zip, 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 zip. Square waves look like this. They have flat tops on them because they are compressed. You don't need to compress things that are already compressed, like distorted electric guitars. Now, if you want to use a multi-band compressor, which we'll talk about after, to tone shape, that's a completely different thing. We'll come to that in a minute. Okay, the first thing we're going to talk about is ratio. You know on your compressor when you see these things, it says like 2 to 1 or 4 to 1? That is your ratio. Let me explain the ratio control, whether you're going into Logic or Pro Tools or, or Sonar, whatever you're going into. A two to one ratio, once a signal that coming into the compressor exceeds the threshold by two dB, it'll be attenuated or turned down by one dB. If the threshold was exceeded by eight dB, it would be turned down by four dB. So that's how this two to one works. If it were 16 dB, it'd be turned down by eight dB. And the other ratios work the same way. But typically, two to one ratio is mild compression. It starts to get more moderate around three to one, four to one. Four to one is typically what mixers use on the mix bus, okay? I have bass here, that's kind of common, but mix bus is really, most big mixers will use a four to one ratio on the mix bus. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Then you start getting into medium compression around six to one or so, and then you start getting into stronger compression around 10 to one. That's where you start, compressing your room mics where you want to get that kind of Led Zeppelin when the levee breaks kind of sound is compression of those room mics so they start to pump and it sound like they have a lot of energy. Next we have attack and release times. Okay, the attack time simply is how fast does your compressor grab the sound. If you have a slow attack time, it lets more of the transient get through. The transient the initial strike, like a snare drum, has a very quick transient and then the sound decays fast. Or a piano has a quick transient. Or acoustic guitar. Did you notice how the piano and snare drum waves looked almost identical? They have this huge transient here and then it tapers afterwards. This transient is what you want to control sometimes. If you heavily compress it, it will literally flat top that and compress the bandwidth. That's what compression does right there. Same with the acoustic guitar. It's got a lot of those spikes in it 
spikes, right? The dynamic range of those spikes can be controlled by compression. Same with base parts. You'll see a lot of these really sharp transients on the tacks, and then you might see the volume, the amplitude go up and down. What you wanna do is you wanna smooth that and make it more consistent. That's one of the things you use compression for. If you have a fast attack time on something that has a quick transient, you're gonna hear the compression. You may want the sound actually. A lot of times you want that snare to really attack, but generally, with drums, the slower attack times give you more punch because you really want those transients. Here in the top track, I'm gonna play the uncompressed snare. It sounds like this. It has hardly any sustain. This is a very compressed snare. You notice how much longer the waveform is here? Here they are played back to back. You can really hear the difference. Things that you might want to use a fast attack on are really the bass. If you have a bass player that plays really inconsistently, you're gonna to wanna to have a fast attack time because a lot of times that initial transients are really inconsistent. You'll see these spikes all over the place. You can just look at the track in your DAW and say, oh, that's really inconsistent because you can see this transients. Or acoustic guitar, same thing. If you wanna really level out that sound, the, the pick attack and make it much more consistent and punchy actually, a fast attack really works. Same thing with synth sounds. If you have really quick transients on the sounds, a fast attack will make the thing jump out of the mix a lot of times. Now vocals, a lot of times when I'm tracking vocals, I'll use two compressors. This is on the tracking part of it. I'll use one compressor to kind of slow down the transients because you don't want your vocals to be jumping all over. Now you can go through and ride these things and you might not want your vocal to be compressed really at all. But a lot of times you want that sound. So sometimes I'll have a compressor set at a really slow setting, like a two to one ratio with a slow attack time. But then I'll have another one set with a higher ratio behind it with a fast attack time. Okay, but I won't have the input up as high. So only certain peaks, they'll grab that. So it'll grab any really loud transients. So you don't have to go back through and ride these things in the mix all the time. You don't want to be going up and ride hand riding every single attack if you don't have to. Sometimes you have to do that. You'll know just by looking at the waveforms what have the really sharp transients. Things like drums though, I like to use a slow attack time because I want those transients to come through. That's what gives you your attack, that's what gives you your aggressiveness and your punch, the slow attack times. So your release time is how fast the compressor lets go of the sound, how quickly it lets go of it. If you want to get that Led Zeppelin when the levee breaks sound, So you can hear the difference between the dry and compressed room. When I go to the compressed sound, I'm using a high compression ratio, about 20 to one, and I have the release time set just right so that it has that pumping that you wanna hear and gives you that Led Zeppelin sound. A great time to use a long release time on your compressor is when you have a bass note that dies off too fast. Notice how the first note tapers off. Check out the second bass note that's been compressed with a high ratio of six to one and a long release time. You notice how this bass note here tapers off, but you see how fat the back end of this, be that's what the compression is doing. This fat back end here is making the note have a lot more sustain and amplitude so the bass does not drop off and taper like it does here. So you use that compressor to hold up the back end of the note and keep it steady so that your low end doesn't dissipate. Your attack and release times are really crucial on the mix bus. Most mixers will put set the mix bus at a four to one ratio. And if you're using an SSL compressor, which has pretty much been the standard, I'm talking plug-in or if you're mixing on a console, that's pretty much been the standard of, for mixing as a mix bus compression for the last 30 years, 35 years. With the exception of Chris Lord Algae that uses a Focusrite red compressor on his mix bus. The attack time will vary, usually from 1 to 10 milliseconds. And the release time, if you're using an SSL compressor, most mixers, whether it's a plug-in, Waves has one, Universal Audio has one, 
SSL makes one. There's many different G plus compressors that are out there in the plug-in world. Most mixers use the auto release. The same goes for the Allen Smart C2. If you have the hardware unit or a software emulation of it, that, that's just a copy of the G series compressor by SSL or the Focusrite Red 3. That's the compressor Chris Lord LG uses. He will use the auto release on that as well. The attack time will vary really dependent on what you're mixing, what the tempo is, how punchy you want to make it. If you have slower attack times, you're going to get more punch. But sometimes you want that compressor to grab things and glue it together so you use a faster attack time. As far as the emulations of the SSL G Plus compressor, Steven Slate makes one, UAD makes one, Waves makes one, and SSL makes one. I've tried them all. They're all fairly similar. I've actually put them on the mix bus. I've matched the input to where you're getting the exact same gain reduction. And they're pretty similar. Um, I like SSLs a lot. I like UADs a lot. But, you know, I own all of them. So, you know, sometimes I'll do a mix and I'll go from song to song and I'll use a different uh, SSL bus compressor on it. So it's really a kind of a personal taste and it's dependent on the song anyways. Now I've been talking about all these compressors, but we haven't even discussed types of compressors. You've heard a lot of these terms like optical or opto compressor. Your standard optical compressors that are most commonly seen in plug-in form or in hardware units, the LA-2A by Teletronics or Universal Audio has a great emulation of it. The LA-3A, TubeTech CL1B, that's a really common compressor that's used in Nashville. Every time I go up there, people use it to track with vocals and things like that. It's great on bass. These things are great on bass. LA-2A, incredibly great. Daniel Lenoir, who's a phenomenal producer, produced Peter Gabriel's records. He produced U2's, many of their records. He uses it on everything, on vocals, guitars, you name it. Chris Lord LG, this is kind of his go-to compressor, LA-3A for electric guitars. If you're looking for something that's gonna grab really quick transients, that's not the compressor to use. LA-2A though, on a bass, anything that has low end, like a bass guitar, Killer, sounds great. The FET compressor, field effect transistor. Well, the main one that everyone knows is the UA1176. It's probably the most common compressor and most widely used compressor in any genre of music. Both in the hardware form and the software form, there are great emulations. I own the Waves ones, I own the uh, Bomb Factory, I own the UAD ones. I like the UAD ones. I like the fact that they are the ones that did their own modeling of their own hardware. I think they sound fantastic. These are very colored sounding and they're not transparent, which means the same thing. These are very colored sounding. I, says, I say not transparent, well, it means the same thing. Um, they start with a four to one ratio. They have super fast attack and release times. The 1176 is a bit confusing to people regarding the attack and release time because they're actually backwards from what you would think. The fastest attack is seven and the fastest release is seven on it. So all the way to the right. For, for tracking vocals, go-to compressor right there. Killer sounding. At the bottom here, the VCA compressor. Voltage controlled amplifier, SSL G+. Or you can find a rack unit 384, it's called. The Neve 33609 compressor limiter. These are mixed bus compressors. They're mastering compressors. They're great at handling program information, meaning they're great at handling mixes. If you can afford the, the real ones, you'd be psyched. But the emulations are fantastic. I have... Uh, the Waves ones, I have the UAD ones on both of these. I love the UAD version of the 33609 here. This is really a, um, a killer compressor. And it, it's actually a lot more versatile than the SSL bus compressor because you can use that on other things. And because of the limiting function, because it has a compressor and a limiter with it, it's, it's really, really useful. The fourth compressor design is the Variable MU. It's an older design of gain control that used a rebiased vacuum tube for its gain reduction. They actually lack a traditional threshold and ratio, but rely on input and output controls to drive the compressor. The most common kind that you see and think of is the Fairchild 660 or 670. The 660 is a mono unit, 670 is a stereo unit. Think of the Beatles, think of Pink Floyd, things like that. 
that these are incredibly rich sounding compressors. They're incredibly expensive. The emulations are very good that are made of them. A lot of companies make emulations of plugins. EMI made their own compressor to emulate in a hardware form the uh, Fairchild. It's called the EMI TG12413. That's the Abbey Road compressor. And those are incredibly good sounding. Chandler makes a copy called the TG1, and it's one of my favorite compressors ever. It's really expensive hardware unit, but it's unbelievable on drum room mics. It is so fat. You can take the, the weakest sounding drum room sound, put it through that, and all of a sudden you sound like Led Zeppelin. The Manly Variable MU is also, it's named after this, of course, and it's a really great sounding compressor. Two words I would use to describe this, glue and rich sounding. These, these are really rich sounding. They add a lot of harmonic distortion information to them, and they really make your mix sound fat and glue it together. You have to experiment with them, especially with the input and output controls to get them to compress just how you want it to. But if you can ever afford a real Fairchild, they're phenomenal. You can use the Fairchild plugins. They're incredibly good sounding. I own the UAD, Steven Slate, and Waves. I use all three of them. If you want to get that drum sound like Tomorrow Never Knows by the Beatles that's on Revolver, that's a Fairchild 660. I use them on the mix bus when I want something to have a vintage vibe, or if I really want to compress the drums in a real particular way, it squishes them and makes them sound super explosive. Other types of compressors that I use all the time, multiband compressors. I've been using them forever. I started out years ago with the McDSP MC2000, and then they, they introduced the ML4000. I remember talking with Chad Blake, who's one of the best mixers out there, and Chad uses this ML4000 multiband limiter on his mix bus. What's great about it is that you can use it instead of an EQ. You can take a sound, you could take a guitar sound, you could take a keyboard sound and radically change it because you can select what areas of the sound like an EQ. You can compress them, then you can move the volume sliders and actually completely change the tone. And I actually find them more effective than EQs in some cases. If there's a problem frequency in an instrument or I want to just radically alter a sound, I'll go with a multiband compressor. Most of them have at least four bands and you can move the crossover point. The C6 is actually a six band. FabFilter Pro MB is fantastic. All the FabFilter, their gate is one of the best. I really like FabFilter stuff. Isotope Ozone 7, I have their whole suite. So I'm a big fan of multiband compressors. Like I said, I've used them on the mix bus. Sometimes I'll put a multiband compressor on the mix bus before my bus compressor. And I will shape the mix with it and mix into the bus compressor. Number two here, side chain or ducking. It's using a signal to trigger the compressor. Let's say you had a snare drum that sounded really bad in your overheads and you wanted to put in a sample to cover it up and you didn't want the real snare drum in there, you can trigger the compressor to duck the snare from the overhead track every time it hits and it'll just disappear out of there so that your snare sample can be heard unimpeded by what's coming through the overhead mics. Also, this is really used a lot in EDM music. You can have a synth bass sound and have a kick drum going and when your kick hits, what you can do is you can send the kick signal to the compressed bass channel and use a compressor plug-in that has a key gate in it. So you send this bus signal to it and you say, let's say you send it out bus 10, you put the input of the compressor's key gate to bus 10. So every time the kick hits, it ducks the level of the bass. So it makes the kick much more present and punchy. And it keeps you from having to do things with EQ that you don't really want to do because you want to keep your low end really full. Some of the compressors that have key gating, Waves H Compressor, the API 2500, and the FabFilter Pro MB. These are all great side chaining and ducking compressors. And the last thing on here is parallel compression. Most of you know what parallel compression is now because virtually all compressors have mix knobs on them. Basically, they call it New York style compression. That's what they called it years and years ago. But it's basically blending an uncompressed sound with a heavily compressed sound. I love parallel compression on all different instruments. It's really great on vocals. If you have a vocal that's not quite sitting in the mix and sometimes just gets buried, having the parallel compression where you have that really compressed track that when the 
initial one that's not as compressed drops below that threshold, the track with parallel compression comes up and it fills it in and makes it sound way fatter. Like I said, most compressors that are out today in plug-in form have a mix knob on them. One of my favorite ones that I've used forever is the glue. I love the glue. It's kind of like an emulation of an SSL compressor. I like to use it on my drum bus. It's really cool because you can shape the sound with it. And using that mix knob, you can really compress it, but you can then back it off so you don't really hear the pumping on it. But yet it just makes the drum sound way, way more tight and solid. Also, the Kush Audio UBK1, you saw me use it earlier in the video on my drum room mics. I've had that plug in since it came out. And it's really, really great. It's got a lot of different things. It's got, you can add harmonic distortion with it. You can have compression. It emulates five different compressors. And it's one of my favorite plugins, period. Here's the plugins I like to use on my drum set for both tracking and mixing. Because I have some of these hardware units. For example, on the kick, I like to track with a DBX160VU because I have one. But most of the time, I'll track with no compression on it. It depends on what I'm doing. But for mixing, UAD makes a great emulation of this. It. Really snappy. I also like the Waves SSL channel strip. I like the Metric Halo channel strip. It's really versatile and it's got a great EQ on it. It's got a compression and a great EQ. Uh, on the snare, I like the DBX160 SSL channel strip, the UA1176 or Bomb Factory. There, I mean, there's many different ones. The Wave ones are great, the Chris Lord LG ones. I like the Metric Halo Channel Strip. Again, if I need that EQ along with the compression, that has such a tight cue that you can really notch out unwanted ring if it's out of tune with the track. I also like the Distressor, the plugin, the UAD plugin, Distressor plugin. And I own a Distressor, and I'll use it sometimes tracking the snare. For the toms, I like the SSL Channel Strip because I'm always compressing them just a little bit and I'm gonna take out some more mids, 500 hertz or so, or maybe four, between four and 500 hertz. On my overheads, I don't compress the overheads a lot. I like to ride them up and down. I like to ride them on the hits and then ride them back because I don't like to, to influence the drum sound too much. So I don't like to compress them. If I'm gonna compress them, I'm gonna might do some radical stuff. I like this 1176 plugin, the SSL channel strip plugin, Channel Strip by Metric Halo. I like the Renaissance Channel Strip. I like Channel Strips because I can shape the sound if I want to take mid-range out of the overheads for some reason, or if I want to take a lot of low end out of the overheads and use them as cymbal mics, I can do that because I like to have that compressor and EQ together. A lot of people ask me, what do you like? Do you like putting the EQ first or last? It depends, it depends on what the sound is. You don't want to accentuate something that has a weird EQ with compression, so you'll EQ it before. But if you like the sound and you want to shape it after it's been compressed, then you put the EQ after. On the room mics, my favorite room mic uh, compressor plugin is the Kush Audio UBK1. You see it in the video here. I like the SSL channel strip. I like the MC2000 by McDSP. That's a great multiband compressor. Sounds killer on room mics. Any of the 1176 emulations, the Bomb Factory, the Chris Lord LG ones that Waves makes, they're all great. They work great. And the Distressor emulation works great as well. Compressor plugins I like on bass, LA-2A. I love it for tracking as well. It's my favorite tracking compressor for bass. The DBX-160 is my second favorite one. That sounds killer for tracking and mixing. 1176 works great. The thing about the LA-2A Fairchild, these things really retain the low end a lot. Especially the LA-2A retains the, the big bottom end and just levels it out nicely. But the Fairchild is an excellent choice as well for the bass. On acoustic guitar, I always compress acoustic guitar when I'm tracking. So I'm going to use something like my Distressor 1176. Something that's fast. I don't like to over compress the acoustic on tracking because you a lot of times you get stuck with something that you don't want. But in mix, I always use compression, or most of the time use compression on the acoustic guitar. 1176 plug-in, LA-2A plug-in. A lot of times I use a multiband compressor, and I have all different multiband compressors. They work really well. The Wave CLA Guitar Fader Pack works really great because it's got compression on it that sounds good, and it's got effects along with it, so you can actually do everything right in it. For electric guitar, if it's a distorted electric guitar, I usually do not compress it at all. It's already super compressed. But for a clean electric guitar, if it has a lot of, like a skank part 
cat, 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 cat. I want something that's going to grab it fast. LA3, A1176, DBX160. But a lot of times, those things, I will put compression while I'm tracking on it. Maybe even with a pedal beforehand. On a piano, I pretty much only use compression if I'm doing rock music or any type of electronic music. If I'm doing jazz or, well, even if I'm recording country, I'll use compression. It helps to jump out of the mix. I want something, maybe the UBK uh, compressor, the Kush Audio. SSL Channel Strip is great. The 1176 Fairchild is great. The API 2500. It could be a lot of different things because generally to make the piano sit in the track, you're going to want to use maybe some compression and you're going to EQ it as well. Really depends. If it's a piano feature, then you're not going to use it so much because you don't want it to. You don't want to hear it. That's the thing. It's really all. It really depends on what's going on on the track with the piano. But if you're trying to cut through a dense rock track and you've got piano in there, you're going to be using some compression on it. For vocals, I have a bunch of go-to compressors. It really depends. When I'm tracking, I pretty much always use compression. I'll use an 1176 or a Distressor, or sometimes I'll use an LA-2A that's a slow compressor, and then grab the peaks with a Distressor or something that's really fast that can grab it. Just the really, really loud peaks. Uh, 1176 Distressor, Fairchild, if you want some color in your vocals, DBX160, LA2A is a great vocal compressor, LA3A is a great vocal compressor. Up in Nashville, people on vocals use the TubeTech CL1B. I've seen people use that for years in Nashville. That's kind of a go-to compressor for vocals. On the drum bus, the Glue is one of my favorite compressors. I love the Fab Filter compressor. I love all their products. Their gate, their, I mean, they, they make great, great plugins. Neem 33609 and the SSL Channel Strip. Those are my go-to drum bus plugins. I'm gonna go through a few bus compressors. I'm gonna turn them on and off while the track's playing. This is a track I wrote with a good friend of mine, Australian DJ Tidy, back in 2013. It's called Live This Lie. And I'm gonna put it on the mix bus. So I'm gonna go between four different bus compressors just so you can kind of hear what they do and make up your own mind. So this tune is called Live This Lie. Okay, I'm gonna put on four different bus compressors while this mix is playing. You can see they're all bypassed by the brown bypass button. So when you see, when I click one on, it'll look like that. So I'm gonna switch between them while the track is playing. So check it out, it's starting out with nothing. the shadow don't make me wait i miss you when you're gone i'll whisper things you have never known so many faces we wear when we're tried to set all the levels so that the gain reduction is about minus 4 dB so that you could at least hear what they're doing. I'd be curious to see what your thoughts are if there's any that you thought were better than others. The glue is basically an emulation of an SSL bus compressor. Then I had the Universal Audio SSL bus compressor. Then I had Steven Slate's SSL bus compressor. And I had the UAD Neve 33609 compressor, which is a completely different flavor. I'm really curious to see what you think about the difference between them. That's all for now. Please subscribe here to my Everything Music YouTube channel. And if you're interested in the Beato book, you can go to my website at www.rickbeato.com and find it there. Thanks for watching.